There are, um, there are a few things in the history of mankind that create a great deal of fear in people. I hope moving somebody's uh, stuff doesn't create fear, but here it goes so I can go by. Um, standing still is one of the things that keeps me fearful. But the two leading ones, one is public speaking, and the other is doing music, singing in public. Those are, the, those are the ones that create the greatest anxiety in the world. And every week, those things happen right here in front of you from people who are just as scared as you would be to stand up here. So uh, do pray for everyone who does, d- does take part and shares in this and um, appreciate the level of skills and practice and things that go on. I mean, week to week they meet and they practice and they go through all the stuff. And when you're home on Friday or Wednesday night, they're, uh, they're here practicing for two, three hours at a time. So... We do have a a very blessed church. It is a tradition at Grace Point to begin each year sort of stating and reminding all of us about our foundational principles. That those things which our vision and mission are built on, those biblical principles and ideas upon which everything else stands. And this this year is no different. Um, We are, in fact, going to do just that. But as we look at 2020, we could not pass up the opportunity to say, this year we would like especially to have clarity in our vision and mission. Um, I mean, it's 2020 after all. Who could could not just miss that? And so we're going to come back, and I'll be mentioning and coming back to and tagging these things from time to time throughout the year. But as we've talked about it as a staff, we've started saying, what are the, what are the things that we'd like to see going in a, in a different direction or be doing, do a better job at in this following year? We'd like to see 40 people baptized in our church, in our Spanish church, this church, in our Spanish church this year. Um, we'd like to see 80% of our congregation's attendance. So that, you know, we know that there's, out of the 500 of you, about three, 350 of you show up each week. Where the, where the other 150 are and what they're doing is hard to say. But about that many of you show up each week. And so we would like to see 80% of that number engaged in something with church. Fully engaged, connected in in some area of ministry and some area of of added devotion and commitment. That's a true goal of ours. We'd like to see 80% of our congregation. So if if you're of the uh, percentage that is currently not involved somewhere, not volunteering somewhere, not deeply walking or or driving towards a better walk with God, we're talking to you. We'd like to see some better engagement and more full engagement from our congregation this year. So as we're talking about these these kinds of things in our church, um, we're going to continue to, to bring them up. We'll tell you as we're reaching milestones, moving through it. One of, my, one of the ones I'm excited about, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see the end of the year giving, because end of the year giving always is a big bulge. You, did you know that about church? That, it, you know, everybody kind of, they string us out through the whole year, and then at, at the end of the year, there's this big bulge in the giving that makes the budget happen. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm interested to see the end of the year giving because I would like to take some time this year and make sure we celebrate the markers on the, the payoff of this mortgage that we now have. Um, that when we reach $100,000, um, we're going to give you a candy bar. If you were here a few years ago, you know what candy bar is coming. But if you don't, well, it'll be an exciting uh, thing for you to discover. But it's just that, that little marker. It's just a small celebration, but it's an important thing for us to know we're making progress. Now, right now, I believe, last time I checked, we were right around uh, 65000 or something in that neighbor to the, to the first level of mortgage payoff. So that's a good deal, man. You've, been, you've only actually had full mortgage payments since um, October was our first, our first full mortgage payment. We were paying some interest before that. So you're doing a good job, and I want to I wanted encourage you about that. But I also want to celebrate some of those markers at 100000 and a half a million and um, 750 and just several, several of those as we go along. And uh, you've been averaging about $500,000 a year in your giving towards our mortgage and towards our building. So um, I want to encourage you to continue doing that. And if you'd like to up it, that'd be fine with me too. Because if we, uh, if we stay on that track, the track we've been on for the last four years, then we will come close to a five to six year payoff. And this plus interest, maybe it'll take us a little longer. But that's pretty cool. Amen. To be able to have, uh, have raised the money, built this building, and have it paid off in less than a decade, how fantastic would that be? And then you start thinking about what could we do with half a million dollars in ministry in our church, in our community. You start thinking about what we might be able to direct that kind of, that kind of money could make an impact. 
You start thinking about all the HUD housing around us and what we might be able to do with that. Start thinking about the, the raising of some sort of uh, community center that really gives a neutral place for people to come to. Um, I told you already I want to buy the insurance uh, office across the street, turn it into a community center and a, a little kind of coffee shop gathering place for the folks because we have around us, I think it's five HUD housing units. They're the only ones in Rockland and they're all within walking distance of our church. Wouldn't it be cool to have a place for a mom with a couple of little rugrats running around driving her crazy to be able to go have a place she could be a grown-up an adult talk to other adults and have somebody else watch the kids across the across the room and so they, they could just be a mom and just be an adult i remember when my kids were little um my wife would say to me when i got home so glad you're home i'll have to just have an adult conversation it's such a big deal and you know it wasn't the big deal to me i was in office all day but it was a big deal when all the, you know, the, the, the depth of conversation started with a five-year-old. And it went down from there. So those of you who have been home with children, you understand the, the all-day babbling can get to you. So those are some of the goals that we've, we're laying out in front of you. Um, all of those goals are dependent on your, your involvement one way or another. And so we are challenging you to get in, get deeper if you're already kind of minimally involved. Um, go deep with God in your own spiritual walk because none of this really makes an, a difference if your spiritual growth isn't happening. If you're not being transformed from the inside out, having the Holy Spirit motivate the activities of your life, if that's not happening to you, then the rest of it's kind of eh, just, just a club getting people to do stuff. But this is, this is transformational activity. The kind of fellowship and discipleship and service that happens in church changes lives. Not just the people who are being served, but the people who are doing it as well. So we'll lay out some more of this stuff to you. We'll actually give you a handout. I know you all wait for handouts. We'll actually give you a handout here in the, in the next little, little bit, kind of outlining some of this information um, for the new year. But I wanted to let you know about it. Um, we're going to start with those foundational principles today. And throughout the rest of the month, we're going to talk about some of the foundational principles of Scripture. Creation, as, uh, as for example, how those things really hold the, uh, the rest of the structure up. Without, without a real God who created everything, we're kind of in a weird place. And there's some great things coming out. There's some recent scientific commentary and things that are really impactful for creation and uh, our understanding of it and our belief in it. So lots of, lots of uh, fun and exciting things coming up in the month of January. But I want to start today with abundance. Those of you who are, uh, are Grace Point regulars, you know what that is. That, my friends, is a real ice cream sundae. All others are fakes and pretenders. That, you can tell by the glorious blue table under it. That is Leatherby's Ice Cream Parlor on Antelope Boulevard in Citrus Heights, California. The one and only place where you can get that. Even their, their partners down on Arden, not as good. Go here. If you look at that, you can see why I consider this abundance. They give you a plate because they don't want that mess on their table. It's going to happen. It's going to run over the top and down the sides. And if this, this needs just one change. There was a time when they were not making Jersey whipped cream for this ice cream. And they don't tell you, you have to ask. It's like the secret menu side. This has regular whipped cream, which is, a, which is an unfortunate thing. Because Jersey whipped cream is malted chocolate whipped cream. So imagine cherry and chocolate. Chocolate chip ice cream. More chocolate. More ice cream. Nuts. And such an abundance that you're given a plate for the excess running down the side. One of the foundational ideas of Grace Point Church is that we serve a God of abundance. That Jesus' mission was to bring us an abundant life. And you may look at your life and say, well, I don't have abundance in all the areas of my life I'd like. Well, sure. Maybe you can't handle that. Pastor Tim, you're not allowed wherever you are. The, the ice cream and sugars and all that would, would just kill him. So no, he can't have that. 
But he has Anna. He has abundance in the other parts of his life. (laughs) You and I all are blessed with abundance in areas and parts of our life, and we should be more grateful and more thankful for them. Just the realities of God's blessings, his grace, and his covering is an abundance in our life. So I just want to start with this foundational concept that we believe in an abundant God in a world of scarcity. You know what these, these, these little flying rats are saying, right? Remember? Some of, this, was in, this was revealed to us by a cartoon. Mine, mine. Mine, 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 mine. And now every time a seagull flies over your head squawking, you know what it's saying. You may be holding the sandwich, but it's mine, 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 mine. That's the scarcity person. That's the person who lives in our world, who lives in an idea, a concept of scarcity in their heart. They're constantly trying to gather other stuff, trying to pull into their own little garage, their own little bank account, their own little life, the things that belong to others because they're mine, they're mine, they should be mine. If they're not mine, they should be mine. I want mine, mine, mine. Can I have mine? Can I have mine? I want mine. Which one of these is mine? How can I have mine? I want mine. I want mine in my bank account. I would like mine in my house. I'd like mine and mine and mine and mine and mine and mine and mine. Because that's scarcity. That's what scarcity is about. We live in a world of scarcity. Our economy is built on scarcity. And, it, and believe me, it's, it's the best of a bunch of bad, op- bad opportunities. But until Jesus comes, until this becomes a benevolent dictatorship massively running the entire universe, we're going to be stuck with it. But it's still based on the concept of scarcity. We live in a world of scarcity. If you think about your own heart, it's very hard not to feel that level of scarcity. 2008, when the, uh, when the economy crashed and your, uh, your accounts started to go sideways and you realized that you were on the edge of some things in your life, you're not used to being on the edge of it, did you feel like things were a little scarce? Did you feel a little bit of tension? you feel some worry? Some things start to creep into your life because, man, you know, it's, I don't have, the, I don't have the, the ability to cover things like I normally would like to have. And when we start getting close to the margins in any area of our life, when our, when our relationships start to go south, we start to have trouble with our, with our kids, with our wife, with our husband, with our, our family members and other guys, we start to feel that scarcity, that loss, and as we start to feel it, we start to act crazy. Scar- scarcity makes craziness. And Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, not scarcity, but abundance. This, this is the second half of this text. That's why it's 1010B. The first half of the text talks about what the devil's mission is. To steal and kill and destroy. And Jesus said, but I have come. I have come. My mission statement to you. The reason I'm present. The reason I'm here today. The reason I am on this planet is so that you might have life. And that you may have it more abundantly. Abundance is that kind of crazy looking Sunday thing right there. Abundance is more than adequate. It's more than just enough. When you go on a diet, you know what you do? You know what a diet is? A diet is just adequate, right? Look down if you can't see your belt buckle. Most of us are doing a little more than what is just adequate. But that's what a diet is. A diet is, hey, we're going down to what was only required for the survival of my life. I'm going to go and I'm going to eat only what is required for me to be able to to live. And as I go about my business, I'm, I'm just doing adequate. How do you feel when you're on a diet? Scarce. Right? When we're on a diet, we feel like we're, we're in food scarcity. Unless you're one of those people who uh, you only eat to live. Now, I don't understand you folks. God bless you. May your tribe increase because there could be a lot more skinniness in the world. But most of us love our taste buds. Most of us really love our taste buds. When the right food goes into your mouth and it starts to swirl around in there and starts touching all those taste buds, you know that, that, that perfect combination of like sweet and salty, and that starts to just roll. Is your mouth just why My mouth is watering right now. It just starts to just pass through over your taste buds. You know why you have taste buds? Because we serve a God of abundance. 
There is no reason for food to taste good to you just to make you survive. You could be a cow. It's a theme for the day. And you eat grass. It's not just vegans who eat grass, it's cows. And you eat grass all day long. And then, for a big treat, they give you some grass that's been sitting in a pile for months and it's fermenting. And so you get rotting grass for your treat. You could be a cow. And you could think that was good. But God said, no. This is, these are people. Let's make, let's make taste buds in their mouth that just give them thrills when they get something. Oh, it's just a little tang and a little smoothness, and a little sweet. You go, oh, this is why I like Thai food. Look, it's a little bit of coconut, and a little bit of heat, and a little bit of something. No, it's, a, it's a secret mystery of some sort that they bring only from Thailand that just kind of hits that edge, that little bit of sour edge on the other side. Not too sour, not too creamy, not too sweet, not too tangy, but just smooth. And your mouth is able to understand all of that. And all you do is take a forkful or a spoonful of something and shovel it in. That is the abundance of God. That is a God who wants you to be blessed and to feel blessed. You get it? Foundational principle of the way you understand God. If you don't understand God this way, it's easy to start looking at everything God does and anything God says you shouldn't do and think of it from the mindset of scarcity. Oh no, I'm not allowed to do that? Well, what am I missing? That is the brokenness of sin. Scarcity is the brokenness of a sinful mind because when we're asked not to do something, we immediately wonder what we're missing. And that goes back to the original garden brokenness. And you know this tree that you're not allowed to eat of? It's an awesome tree. It tastes good. It tastes buds. And it will make you wise. God's actually lying to you, Eve. And when we're dealing with that mindset that pops up and we're wondering what we're going to miss, we're right back standing next to her looking there at the tree in the devil's fruit stand. Right back to the same issues as a scarcity creeps in. So I want to talk about Jesus as God. Foundation principle, second, number two today. Jesus is God. Say it with me. Jesus is God. One more time. Jesus is God. This is an important principle. There are churches who teach that Jesus is not God, that he's a God, that he's some sort of a lesser being. The Bible's description is that he is God. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. The Son is the radiance of God's glory, and note this next line, the exact representation of God, of his being, the exact representation of God, of, of who God is, wrapped up in a human package, covered in the skin of a person, but nonetheless fully God. Jesus is, in fact, God. Okay? God, God is desiring us to have an abundant life. So we don't have a, 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 a partition between one in heaven and one on earth. When Jesus says the mission, the goal, the reason I'm here is that you might have an abundant life, it is the voice of God saying, I, am, I want you to have an abundant life. I want your life to be blessed. I want you to feel blessed. I want you to have an excess of what is necessary simply because I like you. Jesus is, in fact, God. And Jesus said, we agree in the Godhead. We would like you to have life and have a life more abundant. We would like you to have life, and we would like to just give you some taste buds. We would like to give you the, a sense of touch that can feel a hair. We would, like to, we would like to amp up everything there is about you so that your life is fun. We want you to smile more than you frown. We want you to laugh, and we want laughing to bless your whole inside. You know, laughing is internal exercise, right? You want to get some good exercise? Just laugh your head off with some friends. Your, your, your body starts to jiggle inside, and some of us jiggle on the outside too. But if your body's jiggling on the inside, it actually helps to strengthen the tissues that hold all the organs together. It actually helps to, to, to ex sort of exercise your insides. So laugh more. God, when you laugh, do you enjoy, you ever laugh till your jaw hurts right here? You just laugh, you've been laughing so long that your jaw is kind of hurting. When was the last time that happened to you? If you were like single digit age, boy, you need, to, you need to go watch the little rascals or something that will make you giggle. 
You need to intentionally get to a place where you are laughing and enjoying because that is part of the design God meant for you to have that your life might be abundant. Jesus and God are one, so this they are in agreement upon, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. You don't have happy Jesus and sour sourpuss God. They are one. And if you're reading the Old Testament and you lose that, you will divide them up and you will, put pay, pay, you will place them against one another and you will mess the whole thing up. You'll end up thinking that you have to fear one and like the other. And one has to protect you from the other. God, is, God, God said when he came to the planet in the, in the form of a human being, I have come to this planet so that you might have an abundant life. I came to rescue so that you might have life. I came to give you a more abundant life. You're with me so far? These are, these are the things that if you place them in your mind will change the way you read Scripture and the way, way you understand God. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. I, the Lord, do not change. So has this been different before? No. So God has eternally wanted to give his blessings to all whom are his children, his creation. So, you know, the angels, he says, you know what I want for you guys, you angel guys out here who are flying around in the universe doing stuff? I want you to have fun. I want you to be abundant. I want your life to be blessed. I want you to laugh and giggle. So can you imagine an angel laughing? Can you imagine God laughing? You know, you cannot have anything that the creator does not have logically and so there must be joy in God's heart there must be laughter in heaven can you imagine how the heavens would shake when God started laughing we always think about the the thunderous anger of God and the heavens shaking because of that but what if it was just because he had such a big belly laugh that the universe was shaking can you imagine I'm looking at some of you and some of you are looking at me like no no that No, we're not going there with you. Yes, you have to go with me because that's consistent with Scripture. I've come that you might have life. That you might have it more abundantly. And I've blessed you with things that will make that life abundant. I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob. I, I put the ellipse in there. What does the ellipse mean? The three little dots? I left something out. I left out the... You guys are rotten. That's the next three lines. You guys are rotten. But return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord. So I want to talk to to those of you here today who are like, no, not me. He might be wanting to give abundance to other people, but you don't know how bad a guy I am. You don't know what my life is. You don't know about the decisions I made. Man, I've done some things that other ladies don't even want to talk to me about. If you came with the burden of those things today... God does not change, and this is his statement for you. Return to me. Turn back to me. That's all repentance is. Repentance is I'm going the wrong way. I'm going off in the wrong direction. And God says, repent. Repent simply means make a change. Turn direction. Change direction. Move back toward me. Return to me. Head back to me, and I'll return to you. So one of our classic, one of the classic verses that we talk about, one of the classic images of scripture that we talk about is that moment out on the road somewhere beyond the home of the prodigal father when he runs out to meet the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal has repented. Repentance means stop going in the wrong direction and head back, head home, head for home. So he's repented. He's headed home. What does the Bible say? If you return to me, I'll return unto you. And so we see this image of it in Scripture. And I love the picture I have in my head of it because remember, everybody wore dresses. So I picture this old guy sitting on his porch in his rocker watching for his, his son to come over the horizon, sitting there in his, you know, his smock, his, uh, whatever that dress was he was wearing. And he sees his son. You know you can see your kids, right? You know you can tell by their walk who your kid is when they're coming. Even if they're dirty and grungy and have long hair and it's matted, you can see by their walk who that is. And when he sees his kid coming over the horizon, I just to me this is grab the skirt, lift it up, run down the couple of steps down to the ground, and run out through the village with everybody going, oh, look at those ugly old white man legs. That would be, if I were doing it, they would say, those things are blue. And not caring what anybody thinks. 
not worrying about his dignity, but rushing out to meet his son. And when he gets there, out there on the road somewhere, out far from the house, where all the world can watch, his son, stinking of the pigs, flocks of flies still following him. There's this collision where the grace and love of the Father crashes in to the massive need of the Son. That is a grace point. That is where God's grace collides with our need. He wraps his arms around him. He hugs him. He kisses him. The son starts to make declarations about how he doesn't deserve what he's getting. And the father takes off his own robe and wraps it around the son. The father father takes off the signet ring, the ring that gives him all privileges, restored as a full son of this family, and puts it on his finger. That is the picture of what God wants to do in your life and mine. Here's the crazy thing. We've been walking along with God, and he says, hey, there's another place where my grace needs to collide with your sin. You haven't been talking about it. You've been hoping we didn't bring it up, but there's another place where my grace and your sin need to get together. There's another place where I need to cover you with my righteousness. There's another place where you need to let me in so that you can be more fully restored to sonship, to daughtership, to this family. Let me explain to you. Let me show it to you. And then he pulls up the mirror and he says, did you, did you forget about this place? And you say, oh Lord, I, I, I always know about that place. I've been trying to not let you see it. And he says, but if you'll bring that back to me, I'll restore that too. Amen. And the crazy thing about grace is that in, in full knowledge of the places of inadequacy in all of us, he turns and walks us home. Wrapped in the robe of his righteousness because we don't have any. Remember, our best day is a bloody bandage. He walks us home all the way back to the party and the feast at the house. You see, this is what an abundant, loving God does. He comes and meets us before we're fully prepared. He comes and finds us before we're fully cleansed. We still stink like the pigs when he gets there. And he takes a robe full of his own personal covering odor, the, the robe that smells like him, that reminds people of him. And he wraps it over all that dirt. And before you're actually clean, he declares you righteous. Amen. And then as he walks you home, he discusses with you the other things that he'd like to talk to you about. And the whole of Christianity is the, the walk home. The whole of our experience with God is the walk from the moment his grace collides with our need until we arrive at the party at his house. That's the God we serve. And that's why his grace is, in fact, the only point that matters. Because the rest of it is also done in his authority and his power. By grace, you have been saved through faith. That, not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Adi, I have recently studied with you. We studied for your baptism, which happened just a few months ago. I'm going to put you on the spot on this grace thing. Okay? So we'll see if you can remember this. We talked a lot about gifts. Remember? I told you something about gifts. One thing that is always true about a gift. Can you remember what it is? A gift is always free. Very good. Thank you for remembering that. <laughs> for a gift... To be a gift, it has to be free. If it's anything else, it is not a gift. If I give you something and I say, hey, 
you can have this, but you're going to pay me $100 a month until you equal the value of it. It's not a gift. It's a payment plan. And a lot of you believe that God has you on a payment plan. He doesn't. God is not having you on a payment plan. He is not making you make monthly installments until you get good enough to be admitted into heaven. By his grace, you are covered now. He is trying to bless you and change you and tra change the things about you, not for his benefit, but for your benefit. I want to get you home. I want to cover your sins between here and there. But I also want you to deal with this unforgiving spirit of you because it's killing you. I want to deal with your alcoholism because it's killing you. I want to deal with your lying tongue because it's killing you. He's confronting us about the things that are separating us from abundance. And all of that walk home and all of that training and all of that transformation, it doesn't do God any good for you to have a better life. It does you good. It doesn't change God because you get better. You're a better witness to him. You're a better friend, you're a better spouse, you're a better father or a mother, you're a better person on the planet, you're a better citizen of the universe, but you are not changing God because you got better. But you will feel the abundance of God when you get better. The transformation that takes place is not a payment plan. The transformation that takes place is God improving your life and giving you a more abundant experience. That's what it's about. So get it? There's consistency with God across all of Scripture. If you understand the underlying founding principles in this, you understand what you're looking at when you're reading Scripture. Why is he trying to get Israel to straighten out their act over and over again? Why is he calling them and challenging them and trying so hard to get the prophets to woo them to him for years? If you read, sometimes it's over centuries that God is challenging them to come back. And as he continues to pull on them and draw them and try to get them back, they continue to to ignore him and walk away from him. They continue to claim that the blessings of God are actually coming from some rock that they're bowing down to. And eventually he says, I can't let this go on because the rest of the world, they're actually believing that rock is the reason you're blessed. And so I'm removing your blessing and I'm removing your protection. And yeah, the Assyrians are coming or the Philistines are coming or you're going to be in this drought or you're going to be in this trauma or there's, the, there's just going to be a huge problem because I'm pulling back the blessing. When I remove your blessing, you will experience what life without me is like. You can walk away from God. You can walk away from his abundance. You can walk away from his covering. But you will experience the things that they experienced. You'll, you'll find out what a difficult life it is to walk without God. And once you have tasted it, the hope is that you will stay through it because you've tasted abundance once. And now you have a, a desire for it. This is one of my favorite quotes. It used to be on the wall in the hall. It's going to appear someday on the wall in the hall around here somewhere. As soon as you get used to this nice building and then I can start sticking things around on the wall. The Lord Jesus, who? The Lord Jesus imparts all the powers. All the grace, all the penitence. So is your penitence your own? No, it, the power for your own repentance comes from God. All the inclination. So is your desire to follow God your own? No, even the inclination comes from him all the pardon of sins, in presenting his righteousness for man. Whose righteousness? His righteousness for man to grasp by living faith. I want to stop on this word faith for a minute. You do realize that it's just a synonym for trust, right? That faith is a synonym for trust. So Isaac was sitting on this stool earlier. Now I looked at Isaac I think Isaac and I are similar in weight, but not close. <laughs> we are similar in weight in that we both have weight and mass. But this, uh, this stool, I saw Isaac sitting on it, and I'm pretty sure it'll hold him. I bet if he sat down on it again, it would hold him again. But the reality is, 
Nobody weighing 220 pounds can really be sure that Isaac is an appropriate test for their safety. So, the question that has to be, will it hold me? Now, I could bring one of you up, but then I would be assuming that you weigh what I weigh, and nobody wants to do that to you. But I can say, yeah, I think that that chair will hold me. You know, Isaac sat on it. He was playing his guitar. I mean, I saw him. He had his feet up and everything. So his entire weight was on that thing. And it looks okay. It, you know, it has some things written on it down here. It says it belongs to Lee Austin. That's too bad, Lee, since you moved to South Carolina. <laughs> but it looks sturdy. All the little pieces seem to be there. I trust the chair. I declare my faith in that chair. Is it helping? Because I can believe and I can declare faith, but until I actually execute it in an action of trust, it's doing nothing. Some of you are trying to live by a faith that's declared, but it isn't doing anything. You haven't actually repented, turned home. You haven't actually declared God your Lord. You haven't actually started following. You've done nothing but say, yeah, I believe. Well, great. So wonderful. The Bible says the devil believes and he trembles. He believes it scares the daylights out of him. If you're just in that place and you have no assurance, you're probably afraid too because you have not actually said, I trust. You've not actually taken the step, the, the one last meaningful thing to do this. If this darn thing were to fail now, I'm on the floor and I'm very embarrassed. I didn't test it before. I've sat on it before. But at some point, your weight has to go from your feet to the chair. And when that happens, you're now trusting. At some point, your faith has to go from faith in you and what you can know and what you can discover to a relationship with God. The problem with most of us in our faith is that we're faking it. We're doing this. We're trying to look like we're sitting on here. There's this pulpit in the way, the big pulpit. We're trying to look like we're trusting. We might even be touching the chair, but we're really we're still relying on ourselves. That, that assertion of trust in God, that moment when faith becomes practical and is actually trusting, when you know that if this isn't true, you're done. When you take that step across the line, that's when righteousness can be gained as a gift because now you're no longer depending on yourself to earn it. Which is also a gift of God. You know, I repeat these things to you for a reason. I would love for you to be able to tell your friend exactly what I tell you here. This is the second half. This is actually my favorite half. If you would gather together everything that is good and holy and noble and lovely in man and then present the subject to the angels of God. So imagine, you say, look at all the great things God, that man has done. Look through the history of mankind. Self-sacrifice, compassion, friendliness, giving, graciousness. You start just like naming all the wonderful things there. Look at all of mankind. In man's history, there have been a tremendous amount of good things. If you gathered all of those things and presented the subject to the angels of God as acting a part, a part, that you realize that's any part, acting any old part, any tiny part, any part in the salvation of the human soul or in merit, the proposition the mere concept, the idea, the proposition would be rejected as treason. You know what treason is, right? That is a person who has, who has turned against their leader and is leading a rebellion in the opposite direction. The concept that man can merit anything in salvation. If you took all the goodness of all mankind and all of the history of mankind and you took it to the angels and said, doesn't this merit something? The angels would say no, and that's rebellious, treasonous thoughts and behavior. The only reason you're going to get into heaven, my friend, is because God is gracious and Jesus died so that you could receive a gift by faith in him no longer in you. 
Grace is the point. It's the point at which transformation takes place when you realize that it is only by his grace that you are saved. When you realize that without Jesus, there's nothing possible for you. That without his sacrifice, you could not actually be saved. Without his grace and his love and his covering, that in reality, you would be lost. Grace of God. Faith in that grace, that's the thing upon which everything pivots. I have come. Jesus, I have come. That you may have life. Yeah, I have come to rescue you from certain death. And to have it more abundantly. And so it is. God gives you the first three commandments to talk to you about how to relate to him. There are no other gods. So to believe there is another God is going to damage you. Don't make an idol even of the real God because an idol of the real God will diminish God into something you can control, so don't do that. And oh, by the way, don't take my name in vain. This is not primarily about cursing. Cursing gets its own coverage in scripture. This is about fakes. This is like that person. This is about that person who's desperately trying to make everybody believe they're good, but they've never, saw, they've never surrendered. They've never given their heart to Christ. They've never actually said, I'm going to follow. And meant it. I'm going to skip the fourth. I'll come back to it. The next are about your relationships with people. Don't lie to people. Don't steal from people. Don't take people's stuff. Don't sleep with somebody else's spouse. It's all about your relationships with mankind. He says, you want an abundant life? Get the fact that there's one God and serve him as the only thing. You want an abundant life? Live principles in your life with people that allow people to care about you, trust you, and be, have faith in you. And the last two I want to bring up are covetousness and the Sabbath. The last of them says, hey, you want to have an abundant life? You want to live a life where your heart is okay? Where your heart is safe? Where you, you feel blessed? Then thank God for what you have. Don't fall in love with what your neighbor has. And you want that heart to have a regular rhythm of your walk with God? Spend the Sabbath with me every week. And that relationship, that friendship, like all friendships, will grow for the time spent and the knowledge gained. These things are not limitations God is putting on your life. God did not build a fence around you called the Ten Commandments. He knew already that there was a fence around you called sin. And so he put openings in the fence called Ten Commandments. And each one of those is a gate that allows you to step out from behind the struggle and the battle and enter into the abundance he wants for you. I have come to my life. Jesus' mission statement. I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So there remains one question. How abundant is your life? Do you feel it? Are you certain of his forgiveness? Are you aware that Jesus died for you? Have you finally leaned on him to the point where if he lets go, you're on the floor? Have you cast your cares on him? Have you said, Lord, I don't know what to do about my ailing friend, my straying child, my bills, my whatever? Have you just said, okay, God, here it is. Four guys dropped a friend down in front of Jesus. You know why they did it? 
they'd finally given up on anybody else taking care of him. It's the greatest act of intercessory prayer in Scripture. They just drop him in front of Jesus. And they said, we're at the end of our ability to help our friend. Would you help him? Jesus declares in that moment that it's their faith that is causing the next act. Have you discovered the ability yet to hand the traumas and trials of your life over to God and let go? That's abundance. To know that he loves you so much that he cares even about that. You see, this is, these are the foundational principles upon which Grace Point is built. These are the foundational thoughts about God that we teach. And these are the things that help us understand the blessings that we have as his followers. He loves you. The evidence is all around you. He died for you. The scripture is fully committed to it. And he wants you to have the best possible life you can while you live on this little blue dot. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are aware that like the prodigal coming home, we fall far, far short of what you hoped for us. We are so grateful that you see hope for us. And that in Jesus, we've discovered our brother to lead us home. And so we commit ourselves to the walk home, wrapped in your righteousness, covered by your grace. We choose to link arms with you, to be yoked together with you, to walk alongside you all the way home. I pray for every person here to trust you for the walk. Amen. We just want to thank you so much for joining us today and being a part of Grace Point Church. We would love to get to know you better, and we encourage you to check out our website, check out Facebook, Instagram, to find out more information. If there's anything that we can ever do for you, please let us know.